As the rest of the Western world turned towards car-oriented development in the 1960s, officials in the German city of Freiburg decided on an entirely different course of action. While cities from Sydney to Hamburg tore out their old streetcar lines, Freiburg decided to not only preserve its tram system, but to expand it and prioritize new, suburban development along newly built tracks. By the 90s, the city was responding to growing population by restricting sprawl and instead building out dense, walkable suburbs around newly built tram routes on the edge of the city, first in Rieselfeld and then in Vauban. By the 2000s, these new suburbs were providing family-friendly homes to tens of thousands of new residents within a few kilometers from the city center, while preserving the lush environment that surrounds the city on all sides. Today, we will look at these developments and others like them as case studies for alternatives to sprawl, and examples of how every country can build a better suburb. Before we begin, I want to briefly define what I mean by suburb. A suburb is a primarily residential area on the periphery of an urban center and whose economy is largely dependent on that center. Secondly, all examples in this video will be taken from the European context. This is not necessarily because the best examples are in Europe. The in-progress Tianjin Ecological City in Northeast China is a much more ambitious suburban development than anything anywhere in the West, for example, but English sources on European cases are simply more comprehensive and easily available to me, and so I decided to limit the scope of this video to Europe. If I get my hands on any good sources on contemporary suburban development elsewhere, we will certainly cover them here later. Finally, None of the examples I will use are hypothetical or unbuilt. All examples already have anywhere from a few hundred to tens of thousands of people living in them. We already know how to build a better suburb, and indeed many countries have been building them for decades. All we need to do is emulate these examples. And with that, let's get started. We will begin today with our smallest example. Driving along Kermoseve Street on the far western outskirts of Copenhagen, you could reasonably assume you had reached the city's edge. Yet hidden behind this facade of trees lies one of the most unique suburban experiments of the 20th century, the community at Galgebakken, our first case study. The development's history and design are laid out in the book Life Between Buildings by Jan Gell, Built in the early 70s, the suburb contains about 700 low-rise homes across about 50 acres. The row houses, bundled together into nine blocks, are themselves unexceptional, but their layout is quite unique. All cars are parked either on the periphery or on two internal lots. Rather than facing normal streets, all homes face cozy pedestrianized lanes about 3 meters wide, with each home additionally possessing a small, semi-private front yard. Typically, 10 to 20 families are clustered together on each lane, with their children free to roam around without fear of automotive traffic. Each home also has a private backyard, but residents apparently prefer spending their outdoor time in public. Gale notes a 1981 study which concluded that residents spent twice as much time in the front yards as in the back. The neighborhood is small, about 500 meters across, yet still contains no less than nine playgrounds along with a small grocery store and a somewhat larger park on its west side. Gale notes that residents have enthusiastically taken to gardening along their shared alleys, and even today the neighborhood's website proudly displays the lush greenery along the area's little avenues. All interior traffic is pedestrian, however, Poor transit connections mean that residents frequently still have to drive to reach other destinations. With this last limitation in mind, we will next examine two new suburban neighborhoods in Freiburg in southwestern Germany, which we mentioned at the start of this video, and which are described in a 2014 paper. The first of the two, Rieselfeld, 
was begun in 1993 and completed by the mid-2000s on the city's far west side. The area is home to around 12,000 people across 4,200 homes in an area a little under 2 square miles, with a net density of over 6,000 people per square mile, and that's including the huge wildlife preserve west and north of the built-up area. To give this some context, a 2019 Harvard white paper suggests that the median American suburb has a density of between 1.8 and 2,000 people per square mile. Being very generous to America and using the upper limit of that figure, this means that housing Rieselfeld's population in American-style suburbs would require demolishing something like this entire area for sprawl, leaving no room for parks, wetlands, or forests. Despite this, Rieselfeld doesn't feel dense. The tallest buildings are four or five stories tall, and many apartment clusters share large, green courtyards. While Rieselfeld lies at Freiburg's edge, it is well connected to the rest of the city, with the entire neighborhood centered on a tram line that was specially extended to serve its residents. This central spine also contains most of the area's commercial establishments, including groceries, restaurants, and a central plaza. The suburb also contains several schools, including the visually striking Clara Grunwald School, with good reason. The neighborhood has proven very popular with families, and as many as a third of residents are under 18. While pedestrian traffic is prioritized, though, cars are still permitted throughout the neighborhood, with most parking on the street. The opposite is true in Rieselfeld's younger, smaller sister suburb in Freiburg South. Construction of Vauban's 2200 homes began in the late 90s, with the first residents arriving in 2001. Using experience gained in Rieselfeld's construction, the city made some additional modifications to Vauban. Firstly, car parking was restricted to peripheral parking garages, and residents wishing to own a car have to pay nearly 20,000 euros to buy a spot. As in Rieselfeld, the suburb is built along a tram line. However, Vauban's planners replace the car-friendly street grid with a hierarchical road network, with the bulk of streets closed entirely to cars. As a result, Vauban maintains a high population density even with most buildings limited to only two or three stories, with copious green space in between. As in Rieselfeld, everyday shopping is available on the main avenue. Both neighborhoods have significantly reduced car dependency. A 2015 study finds that there are about 420 cars per thousand people in Freiburg overall, a rate similar to the United States while in Rieselfeld this drops to 290, and at Valban down to 170, with most households living completely car-free. The social benefits are also obvious. A 2014 study found that Rieselfeld residents knew about three times as many people in their neighborhood compared to a more typical urban neighborhood in Freiburg, while Valban residents knew nearly five times as many neighbors. Finally, Vauban incorporates one final innovation, a focus on energy conservation. All homes are built to strict energy standards, with 100 meeting the ultra-low passive house standard, while another 59 homes collectively generate more electricity through solar panels than they consume. In addition, carbon-intensive concrete is replaced with wood and other organic materials in the buildings themselves. A novelty at the time of construction, such green suburbs have become increasingly popular in the last decade, as we shall see in our next example. As construction began in Vauban in the late 90s, the Austrian city of Linz found itself facing a severe affordable housing shortage with a 2019 paper reporting that up to 10,000 individuals were unable to find affordable homes in the city. Linz had already begun to sprawl into the surrounding countryside, which the municipal government deemed an inadequate solution. At the same time, ecological concerns were starting to become prominent in the popular consciousness, 
and the city decided to design a new, dense suburb that would not only provide affordable homes, but also serve as an ecological exemplar for future developments. And so the so-called Linz Solar City was born. In this case, the ecological need was actually twofold, since the neighborhood was sited near delicate wetlands. Construction of the first phase was complete in 2005 with around 1,200 new homes. While the suburb generates a good amount of solar power, its real achievement is in dealing with wastewater. A system of ponds, brooks, and bioswales preserves the surrounding wetlands from damage, while human waste is largely composted or transformed into fertilizer on site. Thanks to these measures, nearly 5,000 people are able to live in the middle of an EU nature protection zone without risking ecological damage. Linz eventually plans to expand the population to five times that. Importantly, the use of solar power, passive wastewater treatments, and low-rise wooden buildings also keeps costs of construction and maintenance down, fulfilling the neighborhood's mandate to provide affordable housing. The total cost of the development was about 250 million euros, or about 200,000 euros per unit, and that's including the cost of infrastructure, landscaping, schools, and public buildings. Beyond these ecological measures, however, Solar City Linz exemplifies how a relatively low population and low-rise suburb can be planned to form a coherent, convenient, and pleasant community. Few buildings rise above three or four stories, and ample green space separates clusters of buildings deliberately built in varying styles to provide aesthetic diversity. The neighborhood is built around a tram line that takes residents to Central Linz in less than half an hour, while the Central Station complex contains shops, restaurants, a library, and the local police station. Nearly all interior traffic is on foot, with many buildings not facing a road open to traffic at all, but rather a wide footpath. No home is more than 300 meters, or about a 5 minutes walk, from a tram station. A primary and high school were built on the periphery to give children direct access to the green space on the suburb's edge, along with several kindergartens. As in the previous examples, on paper this community is very dense, in fact, about eight times as dense as the median American suburb. In fact, housing Solar City's residents in American style suburbs would require demolishing basically the entire wildlife area that Solar City was designed to protect. But once again, it doesn't look dense. In fact, I'd say it looks significantly more lush and pastoral than most American style suburbs. It is therefore entirely possible to build a dense, livable, and convenient community while preserving the pastoral characteristics many people value in suburban life. More recently, the eco-suburb concept has been developed on a much grander scale at the Seastadt development on the outskirts of Vienna. In response to persistent population growth, the municipal government began work on a new neighborhood to the east of the city, with a design finalized in 2007. The city would provide the infrastructure, including two new metro stations to whisk people to the city center, while a wide range of private and non-profit developers would put up the actual housing. Centered around a small lake, Seastadt takes on a relatively dense form, with buildings generally rising up to six or even seven stories, though around half of the surface area is reserved for open space, including a large lakefront park. While a ring road permits car traffic throughout the development, the area is divided into superblocks of a half dozen or so apartment buildings each, within which vehicle traffic is severely limited or banned entirely. This is necessary, since the official plan calls for only 20% of trips in the area to be taken by car. Buildings take on a range of modern and even amusing styles, while a range of innovative technologies were put in place to reduce energy usage with energy provided from solar power and underground heat pumps. The newly built local high school, as well as many residential buildings, sports elegant green roofs, while nearly every residential building will eventually generate solar power. Overall, the city aims to lower each resident's carbon footprint to less than one ton of carbon dioxide per year, 
Compare this to about 16 tons per person per year in the US currently. While still under construction and plans to be fully completed a decade from now, as of 2018 CSTOT already houses nearly 7,000 people and 2,000 jobs. Let's compare again. To house the 25,000 planned CSTOT residents at American densities, you'd have to bulldoze this much farmland, an area similar to pretty much the entirety of central Vienna itself. In line with Viennese housing policy, about two-thirds of the district's 11,000 homes will be subsidized units. This is probably the single most ambitious residential project currently in the works anywhere in Europe, and it certainly befits a city that has topped quality of life rankings for over a decade. Not all model suburbs lie directly against their parent cities, and my favorite example could probably be better classified as a commuter town. The suburb of Skarpniaksfaltet on the southeast edge of Stockholm was built in the 1980s in response to rising housing scarcity in the city, especially of family housing. The population is substantial, with around 3,800 homes and nearly 9,000 residents. While Sweden has been mass-producing social housing for decades, by the 80s many suburban developments were criticized for being monotonous and unpleasant to live in, with grey concrete blocks scattered around open land in the Towers in the Park style. As a result, Skarpniaksfaltet was designed as a compact village, with a regular grid system and consistent building facades, narrow tree-lined streets, and a red prick aesthetic that would not look out of place in any old European town. The suburb is centered on a metro station that takes passengers to central Stockholm in under half an hour, and while cars are permitted throughout, there are no large parking lots anywhere in the settlement. About 1300 of the homes are social housing, and another 2000 are privately owned with a handful of private rentals. The district was intended to be family friendly, and so a large number of these homes are larger, three, four, or even five bedroom units to accommodate parents and their children. In addition, the buildings contain large courtyards for children and family to relax in, and the suburb includes several public daycares. As a result, by the late 90s, Skarpiaksfalt had had the highest density of children of any neighborhood anywhere in Europe. Facilities for sports and a large wilderness park are available on the periphery, while plenty of shops, along with schools and a community center, anchor the town itself. In effect, over just a few years in the 80s, Stockholm built an entire integrated and transit-oriented village for 10,000 new residents. Doing so prevented significant sprawl, which had already been creeping into Stockholm's countryside for years. Once again, if we took Skarpniak's fault at its population and spread it out at American suburban densities, you would have to bulldoze this entire area just for sprawl. The Skarpniaksfjaltet model is especially applicable to the US since many American cities, like Chicago, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles, already have legacy commuter rail networks stretching out into surrounding towns. In many cases, these commuter stations are surrounded by parking lots or low-density sprawl, such as here near Chicago or here near Philadelphia. And given just how geographically small a community like Skarpniaksfjaltet is, covering less than a quarter of a square mile, we can easily imagine building just such a commuter village on many an exurban park and ride lot. In fact, exactly this is currently being done in one commuter town outside of Copenhagen. The village of Hedenhuse lies about 10 miles from Copenhagen city limits and along a major rail line to the city, but is currently composed almost entirely of single-family homes not unlike many American commuter suburbs. For example, compare Hedenhuse to Westmont near Chicago, which is already connected to downtown by a commuter train, or King of Prussia near Philadelphia, which will soon receive such a connection. I won't go into too much detail since the project is only in its early stages, but the plan calls for building a 3,000 home neighborhood named Neerheden for some 8,000 people on former industrial land near a commuter rail station. Divided into four districts with a park in between, traffic is limited to only 40 kilometers, or 25 miles per hour, 
on a few main roads. On most streets, cars can go no faster than 15 miles per hour, securing the district's interior as a primarily pedestrian space. Buildings are generally low-rise with a variety of styles planned, and a large majority of the neighborhood surface area will be green space. One already completed segment on the plan's south edge is composed of just one- and two-story homes, which face a pedestrian walkway rather than a street with cars. Despite this, with 8,000 people across just 65 hectares, that neighborhood's population density will be over 30,000 per square mile, about 15 times that of a typical American suburb. Let's compare this on a map again. If the plan had called for American suburban densities instead, this much farmland and forest would have to be bulldozed to make space for this neighborhood's population. If we want to emulate this form of development, we have to understand how projects like this come into being. What is institutionally different that allows projects like these to be built? First of all, in nearly all cases, these are not private projects, but development planned by the government, which identifies the need for housing and coordinates private developers to bring it together. Typically, the government purchases the land and holds a competition from private architects and developers on how to best lay out the neighborhood. This was the case at Hedenhusa, where the state bought the land in 2013, held an architectural competition in 2014, and had developed the final plan in collaboration with local and future residents and experts by 2015. The land for Seestadt was acquired by the Vienna government first, who invited 10 private companies to submit designs, with the winning design selected by a jury of locals, experts, and politicians. In fact, the only exception to this state-led coordination I could find was the modernist suburb of Tapiola outside of Helsinki, which was planned and built in the 50s by a coalition of six nonprofits, including a labor union, a veterans association, a tenant union, and a children's advocacy group. The exact role of the private sector varies. Nerheden is a joint partnership between the government and one big developer, while at Solar City, the Linz government coordinated with 12 different non-profit developers. However, in every case, the state coordination is essential. In the post-industrial era, governments have also aggressively pursued the redevelopment of former industrial or military sites. Solar City Linz is built on land that until recently was polluted by a nearby steel mill. Vauban is named after a military base that it replaced. Seestadt and Skarpniaksfaltet lie on former airfields. The deindustrialized US has a plethora of similar sites, but American governments have generally ignored their potential. For example, Chicago hosts two large post-industrial sites near the city center, both formerly steel mills, but opted to turn them over entirely to private megadevelopers rather than emulating the European model. Finally, we have to discuss a fundamental difference in the urban planning paradigms in the US and Europe. A 2012 paper by Sonia Hurt quotes an English planner who, upon visiting the US, commented that, quote, the real core of the American system of land use control is not planning, but zoning, unquote. Hurt presents a typical American urban zoning map, which has more than a dozen different designations and is dominated by exclusively residential zones, which in this case cover more than half of the entire city, with mixed-use zoning that permits both homes and businesses covering less than 1%. Compare this to a zoning map of Paris. Nearly the entire city is defined as a general urban zone, which by default permits homes, shops, restaurants, offices, and many other uses. This does not mean that there is no regulation for what is built. Many European cities include strict codes on the form of construction, but function is less regulated. In Germany, for example, local B plans may define aesthetic regulations down to individual blocks, though at the same time, the author notes that even the most stringent German planning designation, the small-scale residential zone, allows shops, cafes, 
and even minor industry as long as it's quiet and non-polluting. The greatest difference between American and European planning, according to Hurt, is the American system's quote, overwhelming reliance on the mere regulation of private sector activity, i.e. through zoning, rather than on more proactive public sector-led planning and production of the built environment, an approach more common in Europe, unquote. That is to say, while Europe has a tradition of public sector intervention to plan and develop mixed-use areas, American planners do the exact opposite, regulating for the total segregation of use and not much else. Given this tradition, building these sorts of developments is, in the short run, probably impossible in the US, not due to technical or technological limitations, but legal and cultural constraints on what is possible. But this is also a source of optimism, because there are already examples on how to build better elsewhere. In today's multicultural and interconnected world, it should be easier than ever to import experts, planning methodologies, zoning regulations, and international best practices in urban and suburban design, and build a hundred Vauban's or Seestats or Skarpnyak Faltets where we live. Thanks for watching. Thank you.